Romans 12, 9 through 21. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve Serve the the Lord. Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do Do not be overcome by evil, but but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last Sunday, we pondered Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. If we could sum up in one sentence, that would be, give your body, mind, and thought to the Lord, which means dedicate all your lives to God, including your relationships with others and yourself. Today, Paul goes further, talking about specific attitudes and actions that should be manifested in the life of Christian disciples. Personally, today's scripture contains a very important verse to me. Long ago, it was when I was having a hard time because I was exhausted working 24-7 at a newly developed Korean church. One day, while I was praying for the Lord's help in silence, I heard the voice of the Lord within me. The Lord spoke to me, Don't be worried, I will be with you. You just need to spend more time with me and with those who suffer around you. Don't forget to serve the church as my hands, feet, eyes, and heart in place of me. And then the Lord gave the scripture in Romans chapter 12, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Since then, I have kept this verse in my heart as my pastoral vision. Beloved congregants, I didn't come to Centenary Church to do many great things. Rather, my main focus is a caring ministry for each church member who needs a companion in their spiritual journey. I came to know you, to walk with you, and to share our life together. I feel sorry that our church was locked down just eight months after I came to Centenary. I thought I was getting to know you and was confident that we could together build our church strong and healthy. But now, after six months of social distancing, I'm not sure 
where our church members are in terms of their spiritual, mental, and physical status. This is why I have desperately prayed to God to help each church member to each church member be renewed in spirit, enlightened how much we need our Lord Jesus Christ as we go through the difficult and unprecedented time. Now, let's pay attention to today's text. Paul begins in verse 9. Let love be genuine. Why does Paul mention love first? Because the motive of all Christians' actions and services should be out of love for God. We all are familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is called the great love chapter that begins with, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a cranging cymbal. But we often forget this great love chapter grew out of a discussion of varying gifts in a prior chapter 12. Similarly, here in Romans chapter 12, Paul moves on to the subject of love right after talking about various gifts. This is because the motivation for serving in church with gifts is not competition, but love for God. Paul says, let love be genuine, genuine. The word genuine literally means without hypocrisy. The word originally referred to an actor who played a certain role on stage. It came to mean anyone who acts contrary to his or her own true feelings. Eugene Peterson says in the Message Bible, love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Generally speaking, there are four words for love in Greek. Eros translates directly from Latin as passionate or romantic love. Philos is the love between very close friends. Storge is similar to philos, but it is love specifically between families. And agape is a high form of love, often used to describe God's love for people. Surprisingly, Paul uses agape love in this verse to describe our love for each other. We can understand how much Paul expected the church to be like our Lord. Paul lists 12 des desired behaviors that grow out of genuine love in the text. Today, we will highlight a few of them. First, genuine love must discern between good and evil in verse five, 9. Genuine love is unconditional love, but there is one condition that we need to overcome evil 
by clearly discerning between good and evil. If we want to make wise choices, first, we must know what is right, what is good. Second, we must have the courage to choose what we know to be right. Therefore, we must practice the spiritual disciplines of scripture readings, prayer, and Christian fellowship in order for us to reground our faith so that we can accurately discern the line between good and evil. Second, genuine love must be enthusiastic in verse 11. Paul is challenging us to put as much effort into our Christianity as we do into our work. We say church work is never done, and that is true. There is always more church work than hands of volunteers. Therefore, we must be on guard against burnout. We must remind ourselves that God is working behind the scenes in ways that we will not know until the day that we see him face to face. On that day, God will show us how our small efforts bore fruit in ways that we could never imagine. Third, genuine love must be joyful and patient. It's in verse 12. The reason we jo rejoice and patient even in our suffering is because we have hope for the second coming of the Lord. While we wait for Jesus to return from heaven, we must be patient, constantly praying and rejoicing in the hope of better days to come. Prayer is a channel through which the Christian receives strength. Only Christians, while they were suffering persecution, required constant prayer to gain strength to keep their faith. Christians who are living in an unbelieving modern world today are living in a time when prayer is needed more than ever. Fourth, genuine love must show hospitality to strangers. It's in verse 13. Hospitality means showing kindness to strangers. This command shows up in various places in the New Testament because hospitality was a central mark of the early church. In the first century, they didn't have any motels or holiday inns to stay as they traveled. The only way an evangelist could witness the gospel to a distanced area would be for Christians to open their home. God loved us unconditionally when we were strangers. However, we are strangers no more. That same thing happens today when we show hospitality to others. Genuine love is embracing and working together with people from different cultures, languages, skin colors, and ethnicities. Finally, genuine love must show empathy. In verse 15, 
Verse 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Love doesn't stand stoically on the sidelines while others go through a hard time. Agape love reaches out to those who suffer and empathize with them. When they weep, they weep together. And when they rejoice, they rejoice together. Now, the rest of the chapter 12, Paul challenges us to the hardest of all hard cases. How do you respond to those people who badly mistreat you? First, Paul challenges us in verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We know that it isn't always possible to live at peace with everyone. Paul's advice is simple. Live at peace with everyone. If that doesn't work, make sure that you are not part of the problem. Second, Paul encourages us not to seek revenge or retaliation. In verse 19 says, Don't seek revenge yourselves, beloved, but give place to God's wrath. For it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. The reason we should not take revenge is simple. We can trust God to do the right thing. If a person deserves punishment, God will take care of it, whether now or in the day of judgment. Paul goes further in verse 20. He says, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Here, Paul quotes Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21 and 22. When Paul tells us to feed and to give drink to our enemy, he is using food and drinks as metaphors for any kind of needed help. When we do good to our enemy, they will burn with shame at having treated us badly. And finally, Paul concludes this chapter in verse 21. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. There was a farmer who farmed watermelons in the countryside. He worked hard to produce lots of watermelons, but he had troubles. A thief kept coming in and taking watermelons. One day, the farmer was angry and put pesticides into a watermelon with a syringe and wrote a warning sign. One watermelon in this field contains pesticides. I will not take responsibility even if you die while eating. Then the watermelons were no longer stolen. However, a week later, another warning sign was posted next to the owner's one. The two watermelons in this field contain pesticides. 
The owner knows one, and the thief knows the other. Guess what? The owner had to throw away all the watermelons. Like this, we cannot overcome evil with evil. Only with God's help can you overcome evil with good. Although we live in a world where evil seems to win out, that's only a temporary situation. Jesus is our role model. First Peter chapter 2, verse 23 says, When they heard their inserts at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to God, who judges justly. Jesus believed that God was a God of justice. Therefore, he didn't have to say a word in his own defense. He knew that God would take care of him in the end. And God surely did. Jesus has shown us the way. If you feel that you can't live like him, like he did, you are right. You can't be like Jesus in your own strength. But if you depend on him, he can give you the strength to overcome evil with good in any circumstances that you have to deal with. May God bless you all as we practice of Christian discipleship following the practical lessons on Romans chapter 12. Amen.